One by one, I'm being raped repeatedly by seven different men. I don't remember counting. Right there in a dirty lot filled with garbage and field mice running around us, I can hear my flesh being ripped apart by the sticks and bottles they are using to sodomize me for their amusement. Hey, we all have struggles and they can either break us or shape us into better people. And it's only up to you which you prefer. I'm Struggle the Preacher and this is the Struggle is Real podcast. Today, I'm happy to sit down with this amazing person, Yolanda Hughes. Her story is one of a kind, not because it didn't happen to anybody, but because she turned, turned it around and how she became a better person regardless of what had happened to her. And she, to me personally, she is an amazing example how even the worst situation in your life can be a great blessing. Hello, Yolanda. Hello, Struggle. Yolanda Hughes is a North New Jersey native creative. She has worked on so many different projects, but today we are going to talk about one of her biggest projects up to date, her book, Brown Sugar. I'm so glad that we finally linked up yes, I'm after excited. a long time. Since day one when I met you and we had the conversation, I learned so much about you and your story. Yeah. Just, I, I don't want to say inspired me, but it just not even motivated me, not inspired me. But I started admire you, I don't know, to the utmost level. Thank you. And when I started reading the book, it was so vivid. I mean, everything was so vivid. But understanding the fact that it was based on events that took place in your life and actually with you. Yes. It just, it just, you know, I had to take a, you know, a pause. I was like, that was, that was for real. And that was with the person whom I actually just talked. And seeing you, how good of a person you are, how I want to say prosperous, when I say prosperous, it's not necessarily the materialistic thing. Right. And your mindset, everything, just like you are a whole complete person. You, you didn't shy away from, from, from putting it into a book and yeah. telling the story to, to the world. And mm, I know that many people people, many females, can relate to that. Yeah. And, pro and you even told me that you, you, you have received a lot of feedback from different people, from different females that actually went through this, yeah. but they were not brave enough to tell anybody about this, but they still can relate to right. your story. First of all, just make sure that you get this, a copy of this book and you can read everything for yourself. And... I don't really want to ask you again how it was and all that because right. that's not that's not the point of our conversation. Mm -hmm. But I want you to ask you this question: How did you overcome that, and how much time actually it took you to overcome all those events in the past? I can say that I overcame it immediately, but not in the sense that it was immediate. So, in order to get up from the ground after such an incident, you almost have to. No, you know, almost. You have to disconnect from the person that happened to, from the person who's standing up. I literally had to separate who that young lady was versus who I am in order to get up and walk away. I could not go home and face my mother broken. Period. Um, the environment that we grew up in, the neighborhood that we grew up in, you, you couldn't be weak. And I knew that that's what she was raising us to be. You cannot be weak. And in my mind, I knew that. I also knew that I also had to face my brothers and, and in this neighborhood. And I, I had all these thoughts in my head immediately after, like I didn't want them to go to jail. I didn't want them to go chasing after people. I didn't want my mom to be disappointed. And so I immediately made up my mind to separate myself from her. And I do say her a lot because I've never reconnected me to her. I can tell her story, but if I connected myself back to her, I would be broken. And you were 19, 18? I was 19 years old. You were 19. Yeah. And again, 
at 19, the, what, you, what you have just said, it shows yeah. you know, how mature you were at that age. Because at 19 especially, these, these days, uh, people are not that mature. No. And what you have just said, that first of all, you didn't think about yourself. No. You thought about people around you, your yeah. relatives, your, your, your mother, siblings. You grew up in a tough neighborhood. You knew that your brother probably would go and try to right. solve this situation. Exactly. We know in which way, and you right. didn't want to, you wanted no. to prevent. I wanted them. to prevent all of that. I wanted the whole neighborhood to not be hurt by what happened to me. I didn't want things to change, and, and all of this is happening in minutes, in minutes. You don't have time to think about, and I think only because I was able to separate myself from the incident was I able to think about what was going to happen or foresee what could happen. And I just knew like, yeah, I can't, this, I can't be her. I'm so sorry this happened to her. I will fight for her, I will talk for her, but I can't be her. And immediately I disconnected, immediately. I, I knew I was hurt, I felt hurt. I never not knew that it was me. I'm not crazy in that regard. Yes. Of course I knew this was me, but it wasn't me. Psycholo I mean, psychologically, yeah. you disconnected yourself. Absolutely. And that's probably what most people cannot do. That's why they yeah. go and uh, have all the trauma, because yeah. they cannot disconnect on their mental level. Exactly. Because, and, okay, I'm not going to state it. I'm going to ask you mm -hmm. instead of stating something. Did it help you somehow also? Just was it kind of like a relief that you oh, had gosh. to unload or take off your chest or it something? It was an exhale. So. During all of this, my mother would never talk to me about what actually happened. So that helped as well for me to be able to disconnect. She was she would provide everything I needed in terms of going to court. You know, someone would go with me to court and things of that nature. But to talk about the incident, she never allowed a conversation to happen. Not ever, not once. I mean, immediately I was to get dressed, I was to get bathed, and I was to be presentable, even to go to the hospital. And after the hospital, I came home, she cleaned up the room, she made sure I was going to be comfortable, but to sit me down and talk to me about it, she could not do. And I resented her for <laughs> for the rest of my life, literally, until after she passed away, which was in 2008 or 10. It was 12 years ago. Um, and immediately after she passed away, I just felt like, now I can say it. And no one's going to give me the look. No one's going to give me the evil eye. No one's going to tell me I can't say it. And um, I remember... My mom died on August 19th, and I remember by September, I was writing. And the more I wrote, the more I wanted to write. And it was an exhale. But I also got to write about her, and I actually, as I'm writing about her, even in the book, she changed for me as well, because then I started to think, wait, she wasn't punishing me. She wasn't doing it to harm or hurt me. She didn't know what to do with it. She didn't know how to fix it. She didn't know how to make sense of it. And so her way of dealing with it was to make me stronger for it. I didn't see it like that then, of course not. But then by the time I finished the book, I did. And I forgave her. I let it go um, for a lot of reasons because she needed to rest in peace and I need to be okay with her never being okay with it. So yeah, I mean, the very second I got to write, I release sugar in every single sense of the word and she exhaled i was never afraid to tell the story most people were always afraid to hear it you didn't do that out of respect to your to your mother probably right I, I never talked about it to anybody outside of two or three people over the years because i never wanted to hear my mom tell me why are you talking about it or so, so how uh do you remember when it happened and how it happened when your mom found out about what happened. What oh happened. yeah, I remember coming up on the porch, my brother brought me home and she was on the porch and she had heard something from the neighborhood obviously before I got in there. And I remember the look on her face. I remember being terrified of the way I looked because I wasn't gonna look like the lady she had raised. I, I knew that. And um, I remember not wanting to look at her eye to eye. And she just stepped aside and told me, I bring your bath water. And my brother was saying to her, no, she has to go to the emergency room. And she said, not until she washes her face. And that's what she said. And that's how she said it. And it was no conversation about what happened to you. It was none of that. She went She wanted to, to block out? From yeah. She went to 
pulled my hair back in a ponytail and she realized there was substance in my hair and she stopped touching it and she said at least pull it back neater and she pulled it back and just at least made sure it wasn't all over the place but those little incidents like that and when we went to the emergency room she sat there she was very quiet they asked me questions I answered um, when they asked me questions about um, who lived in my home things of like that nature I was because now I'm beginning to feel the pains and I'm a little lethargic and I'm tired and I'm exhausted and my brain is going 100 miles an hour and she started answering some of those questions for me who lived in the house you know how old I was my birth, date of birth and all that stuff and I remember thinking that was helpful of her but in hindsight <laughs> I resented her for it I just didn't appreciate her not wanting me to answer the questions I mean in hindsight I realized that she realized I was being exhausted and so she was stepping in but back then it felt a lot like she was attempting to answer the questions for me and keep it hush hush but she really wasn't again hindsight is always 2020 she was very um, harsh in that regard, but she was very stern in who she was and who she wanted us to be. You couldn't be broken, and that was it. And whatever it took for you not to be broken is what she was going to instill in you. And so we never talked about it, not ever. I went to court. My mother didn't go to court. She sent her brother, my uncle, to come to court with me instead. Growing up, I resented that. In hindsight, I realized she couldn't go. There's no way she could have sat there and listened to what happened to her kid. No way she could have sat there as a mom and listened to it. I didn't understand that then. I certainly do understand it now. But once she passed away, I was free to tell it um, from the perspective that I remembered it and I told it. And I'm not apologetic. I just refuse to be apologetic about it. Why, why should you be? I think a lot of victims do feel like they need to apologize for what happened to them. For to who? To themselves. A lot of victims, most victims, feel like it's their fault in some way. Especially when the family feels tainted by it. When the family feels like they are a victim of your victimization, you are made to feel like it's your fault. You think if, uh, if it hadn't happened in your life, uh, would it be better or worse? My life would probably be a lot worse. A lot worse. Oh, yeah. I think in the long run, I was still a product of my environment. I was still a product of everything else that was going around me. In spite of how stern my mom was, I found ways to get out in the street and do what I wanted to do as well. Um, do I think it happened for a reason? It absolutely happened for a reason. Um, I could not be who I am if that did not happen to me. Should it happen? I don't know. That's God's will. I, I can't say. I don't know. Um, do I? Re of course, I regret it ever happening. But it, everything about that incident turned me into exactly who I am now, 100%. I certainly, I couldn't have done black girl monologues and allow other people to tell their stories had I not had a story to tell and know what it feels like to release that story. I wouldn't be able to teach people how to be unapologetic if I didn't have anything to be unapologetic about. And I certainly couldn't get people to um, forgive their parents for being parents if I wasn't able to forgive my own. Do you look at it like you are, uh, you are God's tool? That he, he, he uses you as a tool to help people and praise his name? I do. I, here's a cool story. About four years ago, we're talking 20-something years after the incident, I'm on New Jersey Transit on the train. I'm going to New York, and I sit across. I'm in a four-seater by myself, and there's a four-seater across from me. And there's a young man in the four. I recognized him immediately. Immediately, I recognized him. And he was with a little girl, couldn't have been more than seven or eight years old, and they're having a ball, and he's laughing, they're giggling, and he's tickling her, and she's calling him daddy. I knew for a fact he was one of my victimizers. I absolutely knew it with everything in me and I sat across this right across from him and he didn't know who I was of course and he had no clue and I watched him for every 20 for the whole entire 20 minutes going to Penn Station and I remember thinking should I say something I, I didn't know what to do um, I was calling my girlfriend like what do you think what do you think and she didn't have an answer for me either and I remember thinking by the time we were getting off at Penn Station and 
the little girl was calling him daddy. She was really excited about wherever they were going. He was telling her to be careful when you get off this um, train to take a big step or else she'll fall through the hole. And I don't want anything to happen to you. And it clicked right then and there. And I said, you know what? This is God's will because for the rest of his life, whether he knows this is me or not, he has to be concerned that what he did to me as a kid, somebody may do to his kid. Not that that's what I wanted, but he's a grown adult man now with a kid. Yes. And imagine what he must, how he must live his life every day. I wonder if he's worried about, if he's paid enough, if he's remorsed enough, if he's repented enough. And then I, I remember feeling like I could let it be. I don't remember feeling any kind of way about him either, but in that moment, I remember feeling this big wave of relief, like I can just let it be. And I think that's one of the most important qualities that God wants us to have, is that when you can forgive people, when you don't hold a grudge yeah. against anyone, no, no matter what happened to you, no matter how bad that person treated you in the past, and what you did when when you told me that story now i remember you told me that before that was one of those things i was like wow i mean that's i'm i'm talking to an absolutely mature woman right here yeah. in terms of your inner growth and spiritual growth and understanding of this world you know and understanding god because i always say that our actual age does not say anything about us right. and the fact i mean so many facts actually it's not that something that can single out but probably this this story that you just told 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 i can actually single it out you know because that's what i think all of us need to do and need to learn in the first place and it doesn't come easy no but that certain feeling, I think, that you have, it's your, first of all, it's your, it's your desire or your will to, to, let, it, to let it go yeah. and to forgive people. Sometimes it's hard because our ego speaks for us. I, I, all I can say, just like I can admire it, was it how, how you, in that particular situation, how you dealt with it. And I know probably, I mean, I don't know, but I, I may guess probably what was going on through your mind at that time and how many different mixed emotions and yeah. feelings that you had. But the way you, the way you decided to, you know, just to, to handle it, that was awesome. That was awesome. And it can be, I endlessly admire it. I dedicate this book first to my hometown of Newark, New Jersey, where I was born, raised, and schooled in life. To my neighborhood of New Community Corporation, circa 1979 through 2004, where I was fortunate enough to grow up in a time when as children we actually played outside until the lights came on, fights were won with feasts, water, or words, and you lived to see another day. Video games were our pastime only when it was too cold or too wet outside to play or because you were in punishment for one reason or another. I think that can be the best or one of the best introduction to a book. And it's so vivid, right? It just paints the picture of It is so kids vivid kids. and it actually takes like my generation, your generation back to those days. Yeah. And we can't remember how it was. Especially what I like when you described how you played, because I think it was worldwide. We all played the same kind of games. Yeah. They may might be called different, but the it was the gist was the same. It we was put, always the same. Yeah. Yes, it was just to have fun. And coming out of Newark, I know that you told me when we met, and you said that you had received so many offers from New York film and different companies, production companies, that they wanted to take your script, take your story, and shoot a movie in New York. Yeah. But you said that you turned Never. it down. <laughs> Never. 
never. I cannot do that. I think Nork is the backdrop. Um, is as much as this place is painful, it is. It is just as happy. It is everything about Nork. Everything about what goes on in and around Nork is because of who we are and what we made it. To know that Nork, and, and because my parents and my my whole entire family grew up and was raised in Nork, that's important to see what we've come from to who we are, who my mom was as a kid growing up in Newark versus who I was a kid and then my nieces and nephews and so forth and so on. It's such a big difference. I can't take away from Newark. And I think it's very, it's another, it's another um, trait or quality of yours that can be respected by me because you don't trade things. No. And you don't go for for a cloud or for for trends for money. Yeah. You you just do you and you yeah. do what you think is best and right. In, you know, in, in how the way you see it. it. It has to be. Otherwise, I don't know if it's authentic if you do it any other way. This didn't it's happen not, in New York. It it's happened not, in New York. It's not. And that's that's what is important. I mean. Because, you know, when you go to a production company, authenticity doesn't mean anything to them. No. They'd be like, okay, we can do it. Like, let's say we go to Toronto and it's cheaper to shoot there. Yeah. Let's do it there. Or we go to Chicago and shoot it there. I mean, because they, they just take it like as a story. Right. But they'd be like, okay, the, back, the background is not really It means important. nothing to them, right? Yes. But knowing you, because it's, first of all, it's personal experience. Yeah. And I know how it feels, and I, I I love I love in capital letters and I even underline it how you stand for it. Yeah, I I think about it as not just my movie. I think it's Nork's movie. I think it's our story. It isn't just about what happened in Sugar. It's about what she overcomes. But then it's it's about what the city itself can overcome. This is a brick city, literally in every single sense of the word. You either gonna be as tough as a brick or as soft as cotton. And that's the way me and my friends and family always knew it. And I, I relish in the fact that one day people will come here to NJ Pack or to the movie theater and, and watch it and they'll say, hey, that's my street or that's my exactly. building or that's me in the background. Exactly. That to me is everything. So it isn't just about shooting the story and telling the story, it's about the story of Nort all mixed up in there. And, and she's in there for sure. And we were on the location when things had actually happened. Yeah. But not even this traffic because this was all an open field. This, that, all of, it, all of this was all open. There used to be a school there in that lot and it was broken down, it was all torn down. So this was a huge lot and that was another lot. So this was all just a big old field. Two big lots. I would have walked, I would have came from that corner and we would have walked down this street here. So, but when we saw them, where that Sonic sign is, we probably had gotten right there. And he saw them. So instead of going down that street, we came down this street. And the closer they were coming, the more he would pull me closer and closer. And then right here is where they, they just stopped us, right, right about here. So we got about here where the Sonic sign is, and I think, he saw the, the guys coming towards us. I don't know what's happening at all. I have no idea what's happening. I remember he clenched my hand and I, I remember him trying to decide which way we were gonna go, but I didn't think much of that either. He decided to come this way and I saw the guys coming at us, but I think I thought they were gonna rob us. And I was preparing to get my chain snatched because that's what they were doing back then. But I don't remember being scared other than getting robbed. That's probably the most I thought was gonna happen. They were gonna stash my chain in my bag. And by the time we got here, now this is all a, a fence along this curb. And he put me as close as he could to the curb. And by now they had met us. And before I knew it, they dragged us into the entrance, into this, this is now, this is all an open field. That's an open field. It's open, all of it. And my hood is right there. Where that says New Community Corporation, that's my neighborhood. That's where I grew up. That's where I knew everybody that knew me was right behind that wall. 
so that's like 300 feet probably at best wow by the time I gave up and decided I'm not here this ain't happening I don't know what I was thinking but I remember deciding not to fight it wasn't I wasn't gonna fight I don't know but I do remember looking over and thinking all of these people gotta be seeing this and you can see the windows you can see the shades going up you can see the blinds coming down you can see doors opening and closing when I think about it now you realize how close you are the people watching the whole thing and what uh where was the house where where your brother met you? So where my brother came from? Yeah. No, no, no. When when he came and to pick you up. It was that. It was this is the porch right here with the red door. So all of these houses were right here. My brother was coming down this street, and you can imagine this street is just full of people at the back of the porch. Yeah. As an adult, as a bigger person. 48 when you look at this I feel bigger than she felt I feel like she felt this small I probably was at least the same height as nothing else it didn't seem this close to me when you think about it man then you realize how close you are to home in retrospect because it's so close and if anybody from over there had come over, anybody, they would have knew who I was. Yeah. I, I like to believe that. These people don't know me, but that's my neighborhood, and they would have known. I, I believe that. That sounds crazy, but in my mind, if I had only went back, or ran back, or tried to make it a car, or something, I don't and this is such a major street, so this is Urban Turner and Springfield Avenue. How does it feel for you every time when you pass by that, that, that place? Getting out of the car that day, I, I, I go past this place often. I, I literally go to the shop right there, right? So I go by there often, but to get out of the car and to walk on that ground, I remember feeling like, I remember telling you, like, I feel so big. This place feels so small now. It seems so, it seems as big as this building here, or, it, it, wow, if I had to think about it then, this is what it felt like to me, this big old open space. But standing there, it felt, wow, you realize how close people really were and how small the space really was and I felt so much bigger than it's funny because I think I expected to feel minuscule and I felt like a giant I felt like okay sugar we're here for you like I'm I'm we're bigger than this we're bigger than this moment and it was nostalgic not necessarily in a bad way but not necessarily in a great way either but I remember feeling like I'm bigger than this set circumstance I'm bigger than this moment I'm bigger are those I, I'm, I'm sorry if the question is not right to you. I mean, you don't have to answer oh, it. Oh, just but, ask. Uh, are those moments still vivid? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. They're very vivid. Um, it's, it's, if this makes any sense to anybody, I, it's like I see her story a thousand times. I see it many different ways. I see it from different angles. They're very vivid. Um, people always tell me about the book. Like, I remember reading it, and I can picture it because you wrote it so yes, you plain, can. so clear, and everybody pictured it the way that it was written. I don't know another way to do that. Unless That's why I had to stop it. I mean, I everybody. Just... I heard everybody say the same thing. I. That's the only hesitation on creating the film is if what you saw vividly, can we recreate that? And I think we can, but I, I still see it um, 100%. I still see her. I, I've never ever pictured me in those moments. I pray I never will. I've never had nightmares where I am in That's it. That's what was my next question, but yeah. you answered it. But you already answered it. I never see a face. But you, uh, day one I met you, we started talking about the movie. I already, 
And then when I uh, read the, even chapter one, I already saw how I would film it, what angles. Then we went on to the location. Yeah. <laughs> And I was like, okay, yes, it is different right now. Probably we will have oh, to so combine two yeah. different locations into Absolutely. one to make it look like that. I mean, we still can use, let's say, those townhouses. Right. And probably the other side of the street, we probably got to use something else, another location. But I see it. I see it as vivid as I can from what you have told and what you have written. Yeah. Shooting the actual scene is the one thing I don't think I can be available for. So I would have to leave that up to you to do it. Um, it's an honor. It's an honor uh, in, in the first place. But then again, if I'm not happy... You'll do it again. I'll do it. I'll do it again. <laughs> it's for one. And if we get a team of professionals, not people who come on set and be asking questions right. how long it's going to take, or, uh, or are we done yet? Right. Uh, you know, I don't like people who complaining, women on set. Right. And if there is a team of professionals, I don't think there will be any problems. I think with, we have a team of professionals. With, uh, fulfilling this project. You said that there were, there were people actually watching yeah. everything yeah. happening. Nobody did anything. Nobody even called 911. Nobody did anything. They didn't yell out Why the windows. Why do you doors. think, how, or how can you explain such a behavior? Um, it's a hood mentality. Everybody will understand that. Not everybody, for me, some people. I mean, people here understand. Yeah. I understand so the hood mentality. It, it, it's the mentality of the neighborhood. When we were growing up back then, we believed 100% in if you were the snitch, if you were the person who told, then you deserved every bad thing that came to you. It wasn't until we matured that we make sense of that because it didn't mean that it applied to everything and every person. Um, I certainly grew up in a time where no one got involved in anyone's business and they could be standing right next to it. They wouldn't say an entire word. Do I think that people were in their houses and ooh and eye a hundred percent. Do I think there were people who wanted to make the call? Absolutely. But the environment and the neighborhood that we were in, you dare not do that. You dare not be the person who told. And so they didn't. How old were the kids who actually did it? The youngest was 14 and the oldest was 21. Do you think that those people who actually saw it, they were afraid of, you know, some kind of revenge? Yes, or... absolutely. Absolutely. Again, it's the neighborhood that we grew up in. Nothing was a secret. It was a secret everybody knew, if that makes any sense. So nothing was a secret. Um, how did you know that so-and-so called the police? I, who knows how anybody knew anything? Yeah. But everybody seemed to know everything. Word of mouth. Word of mouth. Um, Susie could be working at the police station, and you yes. called, and your number comes up, and so she tells the neighborhood. So nobody told anything. I... I it's weird because this is going to sound... I worry about those people because I wonder what they thought. I think it's even more... Years I, I don't later. know how to, how to even... Yes, exactly. Because I think uh, on one hand, it's even more awful to live the rest of your life realizing that everything happened in front of you and you didn't do anything. Right. That's, I think, it's... That's what comes back in nightmares. Imagine being that person. That's why I said thank God, and then again, probably, I don't know. I mean, I don't know, just like I cannot say 100%, oh yeah, I would, you know, just go jump into that. Right. But probably, I'm like 95%, I'm sure. You would That I would right? call at least, you know, like cops or something. Right. Or some, I mean, especially, it was not, just for you to understand, there was not just a regular, some kind of rape that horror that happened in it as a you know as a you know even as a man imagining it doesn't you don't really have to imagine it or picture it happening to some of your female relatives as a human being right how can you do that i mean they could have just stopped at a certain point but sure. there was not enough no 
they thought that was not enough and they proceeded to something else which was ugly and awful and but again the way you turn things around just it was so beautiful about well, what about the victimizers what the 14 year old i mean this is the guy on the train that day he was 14 at the time can you imagine if he found god found christ at some point in his life and to find christ means that you have to repent you have to yes. say out of the word with the words out of your mouth and, and wholeheartedly speak what you did i cannot imagine not only say because oh yeah i did it but you gotta yeah you, you gotta, you know you're that when it to God. You, go, you talk about tears right. when you confess, you talk about tears. Those those tears, not just like a average tears. Right. That's, There's that's, something that's different. There's something that comes out of you. Yeah, and you're speaking for your 14 year old self as a man. I cannot imagine what that is, because even after you confess it, like me, you can't let it be. It, it, it never goes away. And now he has a daughter, and you gotta wonder what his life is for the rest of his life do you wonder is karma gonna come back i mean who knows but you, you don't know i cannot imagine and it's weird because i actually feel awful about that i feel sorry for them in that regard all of them um in my mind they've all repented in my mind they all regret what they did in my mind they've all went on to do great and good things for people. That's another beautiful thing about you because that's how you think you think high of people. Yeah, Even because though, if I think you know, worse of them, what does that make me? But, yeah, of course not. But, I mean, the, the mindset that you have, that's beautiful. It's better to, to, to believe and hope that they, that they found Christ. That's my yeah. prayer. Yes, and that's the fact that you actually prayed for them. And that's so beautiful about you as a person. I think about them a lot. I think about, I think I worry that my brothers will come across them one day, a stranger, and they'll have a sit down conversation and they'll accidentally confess. And my brother, I worry about that. I worry about the reaper, 29 years later, almost 30 years later, I worry about the humanity of it. It should not be forgotten, which is why the story should be told. But there has to be a level of forgiveness in all of this. There just has to be. And somebody has to speak speak that. And so the end of the story is based on all of that. Not just forgiving these guys, but forgiving the boyfriend who set the whole thing up. <laughs> he didn't mean for this to happen, but it happened because of his stupidity, because he wasn't thinking. And even he has to be forgiven, and even he has to live with what he attempted for whatever reason and it turned out all the way wrong i mean he has to live with that for the rest of his life and can you imagine what that must be like even for him something you something so small you want it to happen turned out to be life-changing for everybody involved and you're responsible exactly it's a lot exactly so it isn't just sugar story it's 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 redemption i <laughs> Wow, she, even she has to be redeemed from being so harmful and hateful because at some point she really wanted to kill him. She, no human being can let that dwell and 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 of heal course. and sit in their heart and never. Of course. It never ever erupts, and for her, as much as she thought she controlled it, that's, one day that's, that's, that's she too much. Yeah. That's too much. I remember you posted a picture, you were on New York train and you saw somebody was reading your book. Oh my gosh, that was the cool, that was the coolest thing. Um, and she was like, I, sit next to me, like, let's talk about it. Like, I, she was so enamored that you're a real person and this happened and she wanted to know more and tell me about it. I think that was, I think one of the best experiences or I just moved my office to Harlem as a matter of fact. And so I have a brand new staff, a whole new staff of people, same company, but just a whole new group of people. And it started off with one person saying, um, so I heard you wrote a book. I did. And next thing you know, the whole, everywhere I go in the building, my book is on someone's desk or in their office. And at first I was a little worried about that because I'm going, okay, what are these people going to think? But then I would see people in the, in the kitchen or in the cafeteria, or even in the hallway and say, okay. 
did this happen to you? <laughs> is this a real story? And I would never want, I would want them to read the story and not picture me in it. I needed them to read the story and picture whomever did they yes. wanted to picture in it. And so I wouldn't admit it, it was me, but then they would keep going on and on about, I can see it, I can picture it, I know what happened, and it looked like this block, or it, I think, wow. You know what's funny? Now you said it when I read it, I did not picture you. I knew it was about you. But for whatever reason, deep inside, I did not picture you. Probably because you are so bright person. Separated. I mean, and the way I see you right now. It couldn't have been me. Yes, I was like, you know, sometimes you'd be like, it's not that you're lying, you right. know, that's what I'm saying, but it's like two different people. Yeah. Because the way you could uh, turn it around, the whole, the whole, the, all your life and all those events. And it's so hard, actually, it is so hard right now to, to visualize that, that that character in the book, right. it was you. Right. It's, but it's, it's an accolade. I mean, that's, that's only can be praised. In, uh, in most cases, what would be, like, you know, that that person be either crying to everybody about what happened or, you know, like playing the, the victim for the rest of their life. And it would be easy to associate that person with the character. Right. In this particular situation, you have done so much work on yourself that it's so hard to see that person as you. But at the same time, that's the whole irony in here. Right. But that's the whole, I mean, but at the same time, knowing that, that probably gives so much strength to people. It's the coolest thing. I remember I, I read um, I Know Why Cage Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. And it wasn't until I got older that I realized that it was about her. Like, that whole entire book was about her. And here she is as this adult woman that I've learned to love, Maya Angelou. And she's so poised and her presence is so big and she speaks so eloquently. You cannot picture that she was the lady in the book, abused. Because at some point, you have to do something with that energy. And like her, I think I became a creative because, boy, do I have stuff to say. And I've said it a thousand different ways, and I've always been willing to talk about it. Most people have been unwilling to hear it. And it wasn't until my mom passed, like I said before, I was willing to, I don't know, take whatever my sisters and brothers are going to give me in regards to telling it, um, the embarrassment they may have felt. But I didn't get that at all. Um, they were very embracive. They embraced it. They embraced me. They don't talk about it still, but they've been very supportive in every single sense of the word. Um, they've not been around. They've not cheered me on. They've, they're they here. They're still hanging in there. No, they don't want to talk about it. And, and truth is, I got to be okay with that. I cannot imagine being the sister of a person who that happened to or being the brother who walked up and, and saw her his sister broken that way. I cannot imagine ever wanting to have that conversation. And I have to respect that. And I have to be okay with them being okay with it. But at the same time, I have to, I had to say to them, but you also have to respect me and mine. And, and this exactly. is the way I choose to tell it. And I've told it, but so much more has come out of it. It took 20 something years though. So when people say, I don't see you as her, you're talking a lifetime ago, literally. Of course. Imagine who I was in high, well, I was out of high school, but imagine who I was in college. Imagine who I was in young relationships. Um, but the book was not, was not out wasn't there Wasn't even, yet. yeah. Yes. But I had to go through all of that. Of course. I had to figure out an awful lot. I didn't have a lot of, the friends I had is the friends I had. I didn't want to make more. Um, it, it, it literally molded you. It put you on this path to be whoever I wrote. I was always, a good writer but once it happened all I could do is write but that's why I said that that you have done a lot of work yeah on... okay so here is I don't know again if you don't want to answer this nope. question but probably for those girls out there who be in a similar situation and what what happened to you did it affect your personal life Oh, it affects everything about my personal life. I <laughs> I am 40, I'll be 49 years old next Monday. In my lifetime, I've only had four boyfriends and been married once. So 
absolutely do i don't date a lot i'm not interested in dating i'm not a serial dater i'm not i can't offer myself to men on a physical or, or a personal relationship easy I kind of got to figure figure them out before they figure me out. And, and those are still remnants of what happened. So I find myself always trying to figure someone out before they can figure me out. And I just realized I do that. I've done that. But um, it's not a bad thing. No, it isn't a bad thing. But it's I like I said, I could have been someone totally different. I could have grown up, um, yes, continued growing up in a neighborhood where I dated everybody freely. And I didn't. I couldn't. My brother's became even more protective even more protective so if someone was interested they certainly weren't gonna <laughs> approach me or ask me about it my sisters who are older became more protective and so they started taking me out of the hood every every chance they got at 19 20 years old um they made sure i had a car i literally worked in an office right down the street at michi benefit life and they made sure i had a car so i could come back and forth i wasn't on the bus um i dressed well, I dressed probably a lot older than I should have at 20, but I certainly dressed like an adult. They grew me up even more. And so I was already mature for my age, but I was even more mature. More mature. They wanted me to skip whatever 1920 was going to be. Because I think they would feel safer if I was more mature. And so that's exactly where they led me. Everything about my life changed 100%. I remember wanting to not be in Nork anymore. At all, I wanted no parts of North. Everything reminds you about. Yeah, it smelled. I can smell it. I can think it, drink it, everything about it. And I wanted to work in New York because to me, New York meant nobody knew your name, nobody cared. You can look as different as you want to look. You can be as broken as you want to look, and nobody would care. And I thought I looked so sad and so whatever my sadness I thought I had or this mask, this uniform, I used to call it a uniform. I thought everybody in Newark can see it. But since nobody knew me in New York, I would rather work and, and live in New York. And so by the time I was 22, I was off and working in New York and I only came back to Jersey to eat and sleep. And that was it. New York cost too much to live there, so I didn't live there. But um, everything I did was in New York and nobody cared about you in New York. You can come and go and nobody would pay you a lick of attention. So, yeah, it changed everything about me. And if you happen to know, do you, or just maybe your your thoughts about it, do you think these days it's it it, it tend, tends to happen less or more frequent or it's kind of the same? I mean, those kind of crimes. Ironically, I think rape happens way more often than not, um, I, and I think it happens. Rape happens more commonly within families and with people that we know than it does in the situation that I was in. Rape is so common that I haven't met a woman. There aren't many women I meet who can tell me that they haven't been raped or molested or violated in that way. That's how common it is. I haven't met many at 49 years old. So for the most part, the women that you met, they, they, they've been through either or. Yeah, some form of it. Mm -hmm. And most of them, it has happened um, within their family, someone in their families. It's, it's like an incest? Yes. Um, someone or very close relative to the family. But nine times out of ten, it was a family member, a brother, an uncle. I hear an awful lot about an uncle or the mom's boyfriend, or the neighbor next door who was really close to the family. It happens way more Why often. Why do you think it happens? Your thoughts? I believe it happens for so many reasons, but the main reason is um, because as black women, we don't want to report it. We don't want to see our black men go to jail. I know that sounds really ridiculous, but the truth is we hate to be the one to send another black man to jail. When you, when you sweep away all the nonsense and the how comes and the whys, Do you, you don't think report it. in this particular situation, you should kind of separate the ratio Oh, absolutely. Thing. And if, it's, if you're a criminal, you gotta... You gotta absolutely, 
do we do it? I think this newer generation, I think they're a lot different. Um, I come from a mother who grew up in the during the riots. That's the generation I grew up from. Um, my riots generation. Right, here in Newark. Right, right. 1967 or 1967. Mm -hmm. So that's who my mom were. That's that generation. I come from that generation. And they were very protective of their men in any way they could. And so that's what I learned. That's what my generation learned. The generation behind me, though, I think they have a lot more common sense. Um, but they were, they're certainly in the realm of, um, I don't want to see another black man go to jail, so I'll keep him away from you, but I'm not going to tell it. I think the newer kids, the kids that are coming up now, I love their brains, I love their life because they're so willing to speak on everything and everybody, and they're willing to put everybody in the same hole. I don't care who you are. They're willing to speak up and speak out about it. And so that's the big difference. So, yeah, we're coming out of it. But systemic racism, all of that has everything to do with it. And people talk about um, can it affect, it affects everything. It affects how we police, it, it affects how we police ourselves. I mean, who wouldn't want to report that their child has been molested or touched or raped by a family member? Yes. No, it's understandable, of course. It makes sense. So just like a... Uh, what you want to call it, skeleton in the closet. Yeah, it's the, it's the secret, but it's the secret everybody knows. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. whole neighborhood knows that your Uncle Ray Ray is a molester. Everybody knows it. Everybody talks about it, even. It's not a secret, but no one's willing to hold Uncle Ray Ray to task or hold him accountable. But it's the secret everybody knows. I, now I remember you said this that you were willing to talk about, but never not everybody wanted to hear it. Hear it. Not every victim probably want to read it. Yeah, and I can understand that. I can understand the whys of it. You gotta grow, I guess, to certain to certain level when you are ready to overcome, when you're yeah. ready to make those changes. And in this particular case, your book can be a very, very good guideline, or I don't know, like. A, something that it's a you stepping can, stone, a stepping it's, stone. It's, it's something that you can read even if you are a victim and you can determine for yourself that i'm going to tell it. it may not be today but eventually i'm going to tell it and i encourage anybody if, if you have a story to tell reach out to me i'll help you tell it but you got to be willing the first thing i'm going to tell you is once you tell it you have to be unapologetic about it and you never get to pick it up again you have to tell it and everybody's going to have to be okay with you telling it and you have to give it to God after that and let it be, because that's the only way you can get on with the rest of your life. There's so much more pain that we all have to deal with, but it's that one big plug that's standing in the way of the rest of it. And for us to heal as human beings or to be more healed, because we're always healing, you have to get rid of the first plug first. And that first plug is probably the worst. And before giving it to God, you gotta, you gotta truly believe that He's there, He's gonna help you. Wow. You just can't say that, okay, I'm gonna give it to God, but do I believe in God? Do I follow what God wants from me? It's you gotta think, you gotta believe that you're worthy. Yeah. And I find that most victims don't even believe that they're worthy yeah, of God's love. Yeah, self-esteem, I agree, yeah. that self-esteem can, can be low enough after things so like that. To I know that because up. I've been through a lot in my life, but again, when I ask you a question, what do you think your life would be if it hadn't happened, right? And I also asked me a question about certain events in my life that took place in my early teenage years, how my life would, be, would have been right now, because all my friends whom I grew up with, literally, each and every of them started doing drugs. So I could go easily and do that. But I was so scared about, of that, you know, I was like, okay, what's going to happen to me? Because right. I saw What's what was happening? going on. My dad took to drinking a lot, so my parents divorced, and I was so, my dad, I respected him so much, but he took the divorce so hard, hard that he took to drinking. But I respected him so much, prior all these 10, 11 years of my life, he was my role model. So I could not just leave him. Right. I was like, okay, I'm staying with you. The life was bad. The life was ugly. But I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm sticking but to I you. But I can't leave. Yes. Right? 
And at the same time, seeing all the ugliness, what was going on, it was like I, I didn't have, you know, all those teenage years, like most of, you know, teenagers go have fun, to, you know, to clubs, all that. I never had all of that. But then now, looking back, I was like, God, thank you. Hadn't I had this ah. situation, I probably would have been the a trouble, drug addict right now. Something? Because we had money at that time prior to the divorce. We had, we were lived good. We lived pretty well. We had money. So what, my, if you have money, you saw all you your friends, they, in, they like be like, oh man, you know, let's go get down with us. You know, you and you anything. start doing the same thing. But now I started thinking on my own. I was like, do I want to be there? Do I want to be a part? First of all, I didn't have money. Well, he yeah. took it away. He took away the ability. Yes, right? exactly. So, and you don't even see it that way at first because you don't even realize he's literally saving your life. By taking it away, by taking away the thing that can get you the thing, you no longer have, that's one thing that you, you're going to have to work a little bit harder to get that. And what I'm happy about, but I never brag about it. I've never been high in my life. I've never been drunk in my life. I don't know what it feels. Right. And I never talk to anybody about it because I don't want people to be like, oh, you know, just like, right. oh, you're just bragging, you know. <laughs> no, but it feels so good. Looking at all those things that took place back then, I was like, no, nah, I don't even want to do that. Yeah, imagine what God saved you from. I say this all the time. Imagine you think the trouble, the little bit of trouble you're in now is trouble, but you have no idea what he's turning exactly. you away from, exactly. what he's saving you from. I have no clue what God saved me from. If I had to compare my life to the hood that I grew up in, they consider me a success. I don't see it that way. And I wanted to ask you if you ever traced back what could have happened had oh, that happened this day. I do it all the time. I imagine I could have had five, six children by four different fathers. Um, I wouldn't have went to work in a corporate corporation at such a young age. I certainly would have never had the balls to venture out and go to New York. Um, I wouldn't have written a thing. I wouldn't have wrote down one single thing, nothing. I could have been, and, and old to my sisters, I could have been them. And not that they're bad people, but they are certainly uh, women who have grown up to be business women. And that's, I hate to say that's all that they are, but they haven't lived outside of, they haven't lived life, they've survived life. And so I get that they're cheering me on because I think cheering me on means that they're cheering themselves on as well. I got to do things that my mom probably dreamed of doing. So that's probably it. There's going to be the positive kind of message. At the oh, end. gosh, can you imagine? Probably we can. I think it was all set up. I think God set it all up um, for me to come back here to Newark. And somebody has to be the example to somebody else. You are a great example. You are a great example. I appreciate that. And it's not even a compliment. It's a fact. It's not. I. It's not flattery. It's not a compliment. It's a straightforward fact. That's how you are. That's how I see. You, you can. You can inspire more people with the when the movie comes out and when you. Let's say when the movie comes out, already even through through your book, you have touched so many souls. Yeah. But when the movie comes out, probably you're gonna be a very very inspirational woman. I'm excited about that. I'm excited to see who Sugar touches and and how she speaks to people and what message they get from and, her. I hope they get the whole message. And, the, and before we actually close out our interview, I would like you to read chapter one, if you don't mind, from your book, okay. Brown Sugar. Okay. Journal entry one, October 14th, 1990. It's about 8.15 and Rick and I are walking from my house on Urban Street to his house on Priceland Avenue and I'm cute. I'm real cute. I had on my Liz Claiborne jumpsuit from Lloyd & Taylor with my navy blue two and, a, two and a half inch heels by Kenneth Cole with a brand new pair of name earrings spelling out both my middle name, Sharice, dangled on one ear and sugar from the other. Rick and I are laughing about something silly, enjoying the still warm weather as we were just getting ready to pass an old art school that is abandoned and looking like it will fall down at any minute, not really paying attention to the group of guys coming our way. Just before passing on, Rick grabs my hand and pulls me off the sidewalk next to the empty lot behind the old school. He guides me into the street to let them pass to keep me from stepping into the dirt and broken glass. He wanted me out of their way. 
Just as I go, just as I go by the last guy in the group of seven, I feel my pocketbook being snatched off my arm, and I'm immediately turned around by the force of the pull of my shoulder. Rick reacts by turning around with me, but he is still holding my hand. Before he can add a one word, his mouth is being bust open by a steel pipe to his face. I feel his hand tear away from mine and he falls to the ground. I go down to the ground with him and I realize we are being robbed. I pray they take what they want and just leave us alone. The shortest of the seven guys yells at me, stand up, bitch, stand up. You hear me talking to you. That nigga can't do shit to help you now, bitch. I turn around slowly on the balls of my feet, I'm crying. I stand up as slow as I could with my face down all the while clenching my fists in my hands. I'm thinking I'm only about a block and a half from home. Block. I should try to run from these thugs, but what about Rick? Damn. They got my wallet with my whole paycheck in it, cash. Oh well, they got it now, I decided. But just then, a slap across my face by the male with the very light color eyes, and the next thing I know, the top of my jumpsuit is ripped open, and I'm staring in shock, like what the hell is happening? I look back at Rick, who is now standing at 10 yards away from me in the empty lot with two of the men punching him in his head and yelling at him to watch what was about to happen to me as they hold him back. Another slap across the face and somebody is yelling for me to take my earrings and brace it off, but I'm in pure panic mode now. I'm frozen in place, not moving at all, while somebody else hits me in the back of my legs with a pipe. I remember that. My knees buckle underneath me and I crash to the ground on my back. I'm dragged off into the dirt of the lot next to Rick with the bottom half of my very nice jumpsuit dragging underneath me. My shoes had somehow come off long before now and I'm barefoot. I feel the blood running down my nose and the back of my legs are burning as my thighs and heels on my feet are being shredded by the broken glass and rocks they have hauled over me. As I lay on the cold ground with pieces of cardboard underneath me to protect my rapist's knees, half naked with only the arms of my jumpsuit still on my body, I look up and around at the people peeking out their windows and peering out the doors just across the street, and it's quiet. Very still over there. Porch lights and room lights come on and off one by one, and curtains are separated, and I hear people whispering, but no one is yelling to stop this assault, except Rick, who is getting his ass kicked at arm's length away from me. He's begging him to wait for something and not to hurt me anymore, but to no avail. The assault continued and both of us whew, the assault continued on both of us is agonizing what they are doing to me. My consciousness decides to check out at this point and I begin to stare up at the sky and wonder what my mother is going to think when she finds out what happened to me or what it, what if one of my friends come down the street? Would they stop to see what was happening and would they turn a blind eye to it? Like the gutless warriors peeking out around me? It's amazing I was having that thought. One by one, I'm being raped repeatedly by seven different men. I don't remember counting. Right there in a dirty lot filled with garbage and field mice running around us, I can hear my flesh being ripped apart by the sticks and bottles they are using to sodomize me for their amusement. That was just a little bit of the story. I don't really want, want to go back through all of yeah. that again. And I see how emotional you're getting. So I would suggest that if you want to read the whole story, go and get the book. The link is in the description below. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. That was very, very profound conversation from a profound lady. I appreciate that. And thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you.